Hey guys, welcome back to Genomics with Georgia, the channel on YouTube where I share with you guys everything you need to know about getting into bioinformatics. My name's Georgia and if you're new here, I am a bioinformatician. I've been doing this for four years now and I love to share with you everything I know. On today's episode, we're going to be talking all things reproducibility. In this day and age, it is getting even more and more crucial to be able to write code that is reproducible and is easily shareable with anybody who wants to run your code. So stay tuned and we're going to go through the fundamental things that need to be on your radar when it comes to reproducibility. So first things first, what do we mean? Ooh. First things first, what do we mean when we say reproducibility? So it essentially means that if you write some code, you could call it software, a package, or just a script. If you write some code to do something, the aim is that someone else should be able to reproduce that work on their machine, in their own environment, on whatever platform they are using, at whatever time point in the future that they might want to run your code. Making good code, making code reproducible is a key part of being a bioinformatician because if someone can't reproduce your code, it's bad for the future team, it's bad for collaborators, and it's bad for the community. So it's really important that we get this right. And also that we're just aware of this because when it comes to things like job interviews, I'm really showing that you can come into the workplace and be useful. Being aware of the terms we're gonna go through in today's video is really, really important. So you might think if you write some code, someone else will be able to just download your script and run it themselves. But this really isn't the case. And the reason why is because people could be working on a different platform. So you might have written something on a Mac OS, but someone might have Windows or Linux. So you need to be aware that different operating systems might not be able to run your code specifically. Secondly, this person might not have the same versions of all the software installed that you have just presumed that they know about when you've written your code. And thirdly, this person might not even know how to download your code and get it off whatever site it's on anyway to even start running the thing. They might not even have things like Python or R installed. So having these instructions is very, very crucial to make sure that this can be done. Now I'll do another video on this another time, but the first thing when you need to think about reproducibility is the code document documentation that you make. So this is in terms of how you comment your code actually within the code, whether that's little comments in line or whether it's having doc strings inside your functions, but making sure that the code itself is well commented is very important. And then whenever you have written any bit of code, you need to include something called a readme. Now a readme is often a .md file, which means a markdown file. And this is a type of file that's very important. It explains what your code is doing and it helps someone else run your code. And we'll touch on readme's more another time, but essentially step one of reproducibility is getting your documentation correct and helpful. Now, the second thing we need to do in order to make something reproducible is we need to give the user or whoever's gonna you know, be using your code a certain recipe to follow in order to run your code. So when we think about a recipe, it's basically a set of instructions so that someone could read this recipe, execute the steps and replicate your code. This might be something like telling them to clone a GitHub repository, telling them to change into that directory, and then giving a bunch of commands that they should run that would then reproduce the outputs of your code on their own machine. So this is the bare minimum, writing the recipe. But again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this might not always work. Now let's go into the tools we use in bioinformatics to actually make these recipes shareable across different people's platforms. So the main way we do this in bioinformatics and general software engineering life is something called a virtual environment. So you can think of a virtual environment as a little pocket on a computer that is a protected little environment. So you can run your code inside of there and it's kind of safe. It's not gonna be influenced by other packages on the machine. It's this enclosed pocket, a virtual environment where you can really control the versions of the different packages and tools that you need inside this virtual environment. Make sure to read up on these um, elsewhere, but virtual environments are gonna be your best friend. So there's many different virtual environments that you can utilize in coding and particularly in Python. 
You can use Conda to create a virtual environment, which is a kind of nice entry level one. You could also do the kind of inbuilt Python one. So you've got Venv and you've got virtual Env. Having this virtual environment is your kind of bare minimum entry level way of making that code reproducible. And what you can essentially do is then supply the user a list of requirements that inside this virtual environment, if they install those packages with those certain versions that you're sure of, then that means that they can reproduce that little protector pocket of environment on the computer and run it themselves on their machine. And there's some really handy commands like pip freeze, which can allow you to then bundle up the current versions of software in your virtual environment into a text file and then these can be then shared with whoever might need to use them. Next up, we have virtual machines. So these are more common if you're running a kind of bigger task in a workplace. So say you've got a big pipeline that needs to be protected in a special big environment long term, you might build a virtual machine to have that code in. This might be, say you have a Mac OS system uh, like this one, and you need to run some Linux software, you could run a virtual machine, which would then allow you to then use Linux software actually on your Mac OS. And there's things like OpenStack that can then spin up these virtual machines, or Oracle have a version that you can spin up virtual machines on, but not too worried about entry level tasks, but just bear in mind that you can have a virtual machine itself rather than just a virtual pocket environment. So it's all well and good. Now you've written your recipe, you've figured out a virtual environment. And there's a step further we could go rather than just telling someone how to build their own virtual environment, we can actually wrap up a virtual environment and ship it out to someone. So this is what we call containerization. So containerization is essentially what I described. You have a virtual environment or a kind of instructions how to build a virtual environment. You wrap it up in a container and then someone else can then have that container shipped off to them and they can be really safe in the knowledge that they can run all of these requirements that are needed for your code to work. The main kind of tools that we use to create containers are things like Docker. And then we also have Singularity, although I'm showing my age because now it's called App Container. Is it Apptainer? Yeah, Apptainer now. And these are kind of tools that then can create these containers that then can have your environments shipped off to the end user. So definitely make sure that you're familiar with these terms and understand what we mean by having a set of requirements, creating a virtual environment and wrapping that in a container that anyone can then spin up on their system and run your code. One of the main differences between Docker and Singularity is that Docker kind of assumes root privileges. And that means that Whoever's using it has kind of free reign of changing and navigating and deleting and accessing any which thing it might need to. And as you can imagine, this is quite risky if you're working on a kind of institute high performance compute system. So just be aware that when you actually get into the workplace or if you're in a research institute, often HPCs or high performance compute clusters won't like you using Docker. So it's more common to use Singularity on a HPC. So that's the kind of easiest way to discriminate the two of them. They're both kind of container solutions, but Singularity is best for HPC, but Docker is the general one that we use. And don't worry, there is a way to like have a Docker image and then kind of wrap it in Singularity to then deploy on a HPC. So need to be aware of these terms. So let's just recap. Having reproducible code is very important. We need people to be able to run our code. But the thing is, our code can be importing different packages, different libraries. These will have different versions that are gonna rely on each other. So what we need to do is we need to take a snapshot of the versions of the different packages that make our code run. And then we need to store them in a kind of list and then basically containerize these so that our nice little virtual environment can be spun up by whoever wants to reproduce our code. I hope this was helpful. Make sure that you go ahead and read up on Docker, on Singularity and virtual environments. But as a bare minimum pass, make sure that you are able to create a virtual environment 
and create a requirements file that has all of your versions on it, you are able to help someone replicate your work. My name's Georgia, this has been Genomics with Georgia, and I hope you enjoyed this high level overview of reproducibility, and I'll see you on another one. Bye.